Special sessions. We have uh, uh, um, lunch uh, here and the poster session. At the end of the poster session, we will uh, uh, announce the, the the result of the of the awards, and then the the two last plenaries of the of the conference itself until uh, uh, five and a half. I want to stress that tomorrow we'll have an event uh, related uh, to the works of. Uh, of a network of a Brazilian network uh, uh, on uh, dengue, and all the participants of this uh, conference are, are welcome to participate. So there will be activities. It will be here. Uh, it will be here uh, only the, during the morning, and there will be activities uh, freely open to to everybody. Okay. So we can have more details are provided on the on the website uh, con uh, concerning the the program of this uh, small event. So. Now I will uh, give the microphone to uh, Flavio uh, Codesso, who will, who will be the chair for these uh, two plenary uh, sessions. Uh, Flavio is a professor at the uh, FGV at the School of Applied Mathematics. So, Flavio. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, I'm glad to see you, at least some of you, back today after the sumptuous dinner of last night. So I guess that many of us are still digesting like I suggested but um, it's our pleasure to have uh, uh, with us today uh, Crystal Donnelly uh, which is professor of uh, uh, statistical epidemiology at the Imperial College uh, Crystal is a very amazing work in 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 the, in the interface of control of epidemic diseases and in in modeling and she has done very important work also in parameter estimation in the in the context of models of uh, transmission of uh, epidemic diseases and she will talk to us today on sorry <laughs> uh, about uh, the west africa ebola epidemic understanding epidemiology and informing control crystal Thank you very much for the invitation. So today is an amazing day, because today is the day when the WHO has declared that um, Liberia is officially Ebola free, which means it is the first time in two years that the entire world is officially Ebola free. Now that doesn't mean that there won't be subsequent cases that could arise from this very extreme epidemic, but it is the best news so far that we've had with all three of the um, heavily affected countries in West Africa being officially, TV, or officially Ebola free at the same time. So it's an amazing day. Uh, I'm presenting today as one person, but on behalf of a large group at Imperial, which you see a picture of here. Um, so we had 14 people at Imperial who were working uh, largely full time on Ebola for many months, starting in August of uh, 2014 but that then is one part of a still larger network which was the WHO Ebola response team and that included many staff at WHO particularly the person who interfaced the people who interfaced most directly with us which were Chris Dye the director of strategy and Bruce Aylward who was brought in he used to work on polio and then he became director general or sorry, Deputy Director General of the WHO, one of three Deputy Directors, and then he was put in charge of the Ebola response um, efforts. So we were interacted directly with him. And then of course there were the Ministry of Health and people on the ground in each of the three main affected countries of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And then there were further collaborators as well, but that was, those were the, were the main people involved in this effort. And you can't have escaped over the last two years uh, news about Ebola. It was it started in December 2013 in Guinea. It went on to create on the order of 20,000 confirmed and uh, probable cases. If you look at, depending on how you classify it, if you include suspected, that goes up to about 28,000. So just inordinate number of cases compared with um, what had been seen in the past. So most patients were between 15 and 45, uh, but there were a substantial number of healthcare workers. And although you may think 5% doesn't seem that much, 
there weren't that many healthcare workers in this setting to begin with. So many areas had relatively few doctor, few if any doctors to begin with. And then because of the um, lack of equipment and in some cases recognition of what it was, um, many healthcare workers became infected over the course of the epidemic. So that is a particular issue going forward I mean, about how you take already weak health infrastructure and bring it back not just to what it was, but hopefully much better. So it was important to look at, we looked at the incubation period and the serial interval. So the incubation period being that time um, from infection to symptom onset. And that's of course only estimable in a relatively small number of people who you have a good idea of when they got infected because they had a limited exposure and it was before there was widespread transmission. And then you can get the serial interval between those getting some idea of what the sort of generation time is. Those were important because we wanted to know with the incubation period, they would trace, do contact tracing and trace people who had been exposed for 21 days of following their exposure. So it was important to know if that was long enough because you don't want people who got infected not being followed long enough and then becoming cases. And you wanted to know if that was actually too long to be following people because contact tracing was hugely resource intensive and you didn't want to be following people for, for longer than they actually needed. And it turned out the 21 days that had been developed on previous much, much smaller um, Ebola epidemics was actually sort of the right number. It picked up about, sort of if you looked at the incubation period, about um, 95 to 97% of cases in that time scale. So one thing I will go back to a few times is the basic reproduction number. That's the average number of secondary cases you get from a, the an original first case for the basic reproduction number or the um, effective reproduction number as the epidemic goes on. So we, or, we estimated it to be on the order of one and a half to three at the outset. So I wanted to go back to the start and uh, look at where it began. So it was in Gekadu, which was um, here. This is important because it, by being in this little corner of, of Guinea, it was almost inevitable that it was going to affect three countries rather than just one because of the area. Um, it's an area with poor health infrastructure and also a lot of movement across those international borders. So. I mean, in terms of, you know, disease control, you may think it doesn't really, you know, if it covers a certain number of people, it doesn't really matter if it goes across countries. But from a management and health response point of view, it does matter a lot. There are, you know, three times as many sort of people to interface with and to coordinate. And also you have different languages dominant in different areas. And so you've got to deal with that as well. And these are not these lands don't just have countries, they also, in some cases, have chiefdoms, which are very important in terms of the social structure as well. Um, people have gone back to look at that initial case, um, and they believe that it was a, a little boy who had been playing in a tree where bats had been using it. Now, there's been testing of the bats in that air, in the Gekadu area and very specifically around his village, and they haven't been able to isolate Ebola from any of those bats, but it's believed that bats are the, the key reservoir, and has been believed even before this epidemic, that bats are the key um, reservoir for infection. And so it's then these zoonotic exposures where you have it jumping from animals to humans that then can spark off these epidemics. Now, what we found in looking at this was that, you know, it wasn't a new, more horrible strain of Ebola than ha had been before. Um, although, of course, you know, they, Ebola as a virus will just gradually evolve. The um, transmission characteristics of it were actually as they had been before. What happened was it wasn't recognized early enough and it, was, it didn't get controlled quickly. So it just continued in that early exponential growth phase for a long period of time and then was so established and in areas with poor health infrastructure that made it difficult to control. So that is where it started. And so that was from December 2013. It was March 2014 when WHO produced a first formal identification of the outbreak. And then it was by August they had declared it was a public health emergency of international concern. So, but that's in terms of Ebola, a huge time 
to have, for it to have gone on. And by that point, so it was during August when there was a, really a huge scale up of the international response and getting, you know, sort of on the order of a thousand international workers into those areas, get them established. But it's not just the people, it's also the infrastructure because they have to have places, they have to have beds. You can't just send in doctors or nurses, you have to send in beds, you have to send in personal protective equipment, you have to have places for that personal protective equipment to go or be clean, depending on whether it's boots or something that you peel off and then has to be disposed of safely. Um, it was also getting established um, safe burial, safe and dignified burial protocols so that um, individuals who died of either confirmed or suspected Ebola were not then able to transmit even after their death because there were funeral rites that were believed to be um, propagating transmission within families. And so these then, I mean, so this isn't just the science part of epidemiology, it's also the sociology of epidemiology, both through how it was transmitted and how it was controlled because it was critical to get to have engagement. And there were, you know, cases where people got, you know, went into villages and engagement did not work as well as it might have done and people had rocks thrown at them. And in, in one case, actually, a team was killed in a village. So engagement is at the, <laughs> the forefront of all of this and making sure that people understand. And there was a period where there was some controversy on the ground as to whether or not Ebola was a conspiracy theory or whether or not Ebola was real. So you can look back and see, how, you know, people going around as sort of community workers trying to say, you know, Ebola is real, this is what you need to do um, to protect yourself. But it, it's really difficult to sort of, once there's a conspiracy theory out there, to argue against it because the first reaction is, well, you're therefore part of the conspiracy because you're trying to cover it up. So it's really trying to figure out how to engage with people. And, you know, there's a tendency to, oh, well, so we need to go, you know, we need to present the scientific authorities. But if the scientific authorities aren't part of that community, then they may not be believed despite their wonderful scientific credentials. So it's important to sort of engage at all levels going down and make sure that people realize what they need to do to protect themselves. So um, we at Imperial received the first line list. So by that, I mean a data set that has one line for each case that had been entered and it includes um, important epidemiological data. It was never complete. <laughs> so there'll be lots of missing data and there will be errors in that, but it, it gives us a, um, an incredibly rich data set for us to work on. So we re received that um, from WHO. So that include line list from, um, Nigeria, which had a small number of cases, but also importantly, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and um, Liberia, to figure out which one I hadn't listed. So this is, gives you an idea of the um, incidence of, of weekly cases. So Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and this is sort of looking forward from, from that point in, so we were in August when it gets declared sort of, of international concern. And you can see that even from August, it continued to increase. Now, what you'll find if you looked at the news, at least in the UK, and I think this is a true, uh, sort of, I follow the US news as well, uh, but I'm guessing probably the Brazilian and other international news is, the media interest was huge in August. And in November, people were saying, are you still working on Ebola? I thought that was gone. <laughs> because the interest in it went down hugely. Now, what we found in the UK was if a, UK healthcare worker got sick. Oh, huge interest again. So, uh, you know, the, the interest in different places and in the media is not at all proportional to the number of cases going through. It's sort of, you know, political response. It's did a nurse come back um, sick and have to be treated in the middle of London? Did someone in, did a nurse in, um, get infected in Europe because there was a transmission in Spain and then her dog had to be put down because they were afraid the dog had to get a huge amount of media coverage about the dog, which I think was of some level frustration to the people working in West Africa, seeing how little media attention was being paid to the thousands of people who were sick there. So by May of last year, now it's 2016, um, Liberia was declared Ebola free um, it had cases again, and then it was declared Ebola free again 
in um, September. Sierra Leone was declared um, Ebola free in November. And then, and Guinea discharged its last case. There were then additional cases that came back in Liberia. So this gives you a snapshot in November. You can see this comes from the WHO website. If you're interested in this, there's a huge amount. So there's really detailed situation reports and a whole mass of them going back. So you can see it as it unfolds. I mean, some parameters were added as time went by, but then you can see how those change over time. They include things like how many beds were available at a particular time, how many people they believed were hospitalized, what cases had been so far. I mean. You know, the suspected cases which are reported uh, in some of the countries will never know for certain whether or not they were um, infected, but it gives you an idea of what was going on. This shows um, the cases, both um, confirmed cases total, so you can see how many cases have gone through and, you know, up to 4,000 in a particular district. But then you can also see how many had been reported in the 21 days prior to that, which is important to getting, you know, it's not just where it's been, but if you're interested in control, um, looking at that. So this showed specifically how many had been in the last 21 days and how many had been in the last seven days. So if you were considering, you know, sort of current risk, that would give you an idea. And there are loads of these maps. So this was the flare up in Liberia. It was three cases, including a teenage boy who died. Um, it was believed to be um, linked to a, a survivor. So there is at least one um, established case of sexual transmission from a survivor following recovery. So this is hugely difficult to uh, deal with from the point of view of engagement because on the one hand, you don't want to have stigma of people who have survived or even stigma of um, orphans who didn't even get Ebola, but whose parents had Ebola, so people are concerned that they might get infected from them. So it's trying to um, inform people honestly, so if, you know, about what the potential risks are, but managing this because you don't want people to be shunned. So, um, you know, on the one hand, you want them to, to be safe and to reduce onward transmission. There will always be the possibility, of course, of additional sparks. I mean, this is a spark that led to a huge fire. So the spark being the zoonotic transmission. So when it goes from animals to humans, so that there will of course be, you know, an ongoing risk of that happening in future, but also because of the number of survivors that are in West Africa, even if there's a tiny uh, probability of transmission, we still have the possibility of another spark coming from back from that. Now, if that happens, of course, the transmission potential of Ebola except in areas that were hugely hit before, is still very high. So, you know, even though it's a great day for these three countries being declared Ebola free, it doesn't mean that everybody can just leave and relax and it's all fine because anytime something starts, as we've, you know, it's got the potential to create an enormous epidemic. And that will be true until we have a lot of vaccine available and can, can damp it down in that way. And, you know, a huge amount of progress has been made in the last two years, but it's still an ongoing risk. And it's, you know, something that people have to be aware of. And WHO is taking a lot of time now to look at how the international response and local response was organized and to learn from that so it can be faster. Because of course, you know, in that exponential spread phase, the sooner you get in, the better. So this I picked up this morning. I, it was anticipated that it would be today because it had been 42 days um, from the after the last new case in Liberia. So that's two times what they see is roughly maximum incubation period. So it's to try and avoid the case of if you missed a generation of cases that you would get that declared. So so this is the declaration today. The WHO said, okay, it's been 42 days. Liberia is now officially. Ebola free. So I showed you the maps of the cases. They now provide maps like this. And these maps are really interesting because they show how much sampling is going on. You see this little symbol here shows you um, which labs are functional. For what there are some maps that show you where labs used to be. Probably of more interest is where labs are now if you're trying to organize control. Um, but it also shows how much testing is done. Now you can see really very little testing going on in Guinea except right down here. 
um, considerable testing going on in Liberia. So, you know, if you're if you're looking at incidents, it's very difficult to know if you have zero incidents, if that means there are really zero cases or people aren't looking hard enough. Now, that's only true at the beginning because one, you know, if you do have exponential spread, you will, you know, it will come to people's attention. But it is important that this testing still goes on and people are aware and for people who get sick and look like they might have Ebola because the symptoms aren't necessarily, you know, individually distinguishable. Um, that that testing goes on. So different strategies have been obviously taken in the different countries, and you can see that there with Liberia still having quite a lot of testing. It is important as well, of course, to look at the testing as a function of the population. That's why it's live samples per 100,000 population, because some of these areas are much more densely populated than others. So how did it work in terms of our collaboration with WHO and the countries involved? So we were sent individually um, the country databases. We went through a process of cleaning those, looking for consistency. So we tried to spatial cleaning, for example. We had some information about um, districts and some information about sort of regions and try to make sure that those are consistent with each other, try to make sure the dates made sense, that people ended up you know, not having um, onset of Ebola symptoms before they had you know, their, uh, their inferred infection date um, and trying to make sure that those made sense, try to make sure that everything was in the time that we know Ebola happened. So if the year was misentered, try to correct that. Uh, we looked at healthcare posi positions. Now this was entered as free text. So we, there was a huge amount of cleaning to try and get a rational number of categories of healthcare workers that we could, could use. It was also, you know, people text now, so they have lots of nice abbreviations and those come through. And there were those in French as well as those in English. So luckily we had several French um, nationals on our research team just because that's how it had started that way. Um, so we were able to look at that. We also looked at relationships because we had, you know, this person was reported, you could have cases report exposures. And if they reported exposures, they described the relationship to that person. So the neighbor, the guy who lives down the street, this is my aunt's sister, you know, that sort of stuff, trying to get those into a rational sort of number of categories so we could actually do something with it. And then the hospital names. It wasn't a nice drop-down menu that would have the hospital. Hospitals were being created, so healthcare centers were being created, so they would, you know, it was reasonable for something to suddenly appear as a name and that had never been there before. But there was also many, many spellings of the things that had, and those had to really be gone through by hand. It was hard to do that in an automated way. Once we did all that sort of cleaning, then we combined the data and went through various epidemiological analyses, which I will, describe shortly. Um, and we, those, we produced then regular reports for WHO. So we did 37 between August 2014 and April 2015, as well as writing some academic papers, which I'll discuss, and visits to Sierra Leone. Um, visits to the other affected countries are planned as well. But we, we weren't, as our team is epidemiological and not clinical, we weren't actually going into the ETUs um, because, you know, they, were, they knew what data they needed to collect. Um, when there were holes in the data, that wasn't because they you know, were deliberately not doing it. It was either because it wasn't available or just wasn't feasible with the amount of time there. So it wasn't for us to go and pester them. Um, and also, we, you know, we don't want to be in the way and putting other people at risk. So the first paper we produced was uh, in September, roughly a month after we got the first data set. And so one of the, so we produced various um, epidemiological estimates, including of the incubation period that I pointed out, estimated that, looking at the serial interval, looking at the time from the onset of symptoms to seeking hospitalization or health care. And that's really important. So it ended up being about um, between four and a half and five days. That's potentially quite a lot of time that would be avoidable if you could get people in quicker. On the other hand, you know, if if symptoms are, you know, the initial symptoms are quite vague, you don't want everybody showing up at an Ebola treatment unit when people don't, you know, if they have malaria, for example. And so it's a quite careful balance to try and figure out how you get people to isolate, get them tested. But you need a huge amount of testing. And although I showed you the map with the um, 
Oops. with those different um, operating labs, there were not <laughs> Ebola testing labs there. You know, you, you need a high level of expertise and care and attention to not inf infecting the people doing the lab work. So it's not easy to set up. They need to be, you know, well structured and um, facilities that have all the um, infrastructure that they need to avoid your lab workers getting infected because that will system will very quickly break down if that's happening. So, you know, many layers of things needed to happen. So, you know, getting people out, you know, you wanted to get people in and get them tested, but then if they were tested negative, you wanted to get them out as well. And that's difficult if you're testing. There are issues with that because the sensitivity isn't 100%, and it increases over time. So if you test somebody early, so there were some protocols where people, if they were tested too early and came back negative, they would wait when they got that negative result, test them again. Now, that's good from the point of view of maybe they just tested negative as a false negative and they were actually then be more likely to, you know, the sensitivity will increase over time, catch them. On the other hand, if they weren't infected and they're being held in a holding center and there's a possibility of transmission in that holding center, you could be increasing the risk. Now, what we produce here is on a log scale at the bottom and a natural scale at the top is projections. And you can see on the basis that they're a straight line, it's actually quite easy to make those projections. These are sort of projections of exponential growth. So we said if the growth rate continued as it had been going at that point, what sort of case numbers would we see you know, by mid-November? And so then if you do this, all um, three countries had increasing um, case numbers, so we were able to estimate the growth rate, and it was fairly consistent through that, those weeks. And then if you scale those up from the log scale, where it's linear, to the natural scale, you see that you know, characteristic exponential growth. So we said that at that point, that if um, the transmission continued at the rate that it had, uh, been going for the six weeks prior to the, you know, when we did the analysis, if it continued like that, by um, middle of November, there would be up to 20,000 cases. And it was important in providing the you know, sort of time scale of things that the response needed to be big and the response needed to be quick. Because, you know, it's all good to say, oh, well, you know, we can do this and by the end of the year, we'll have this many things in place. Well, by the end of the year, if you didn't, ha if you didn't have a response quicker than that, you'd have way, way, way more cases that you needed to deal with. And, you know, it was unlikely, if, the, if this had um, come to pass, that that exponential growth had continued, there's no way the control on 4,000 a week was going to be anything like the control was, you know, for 100 a week. So the um, transmission would actually be likely to continue er, and possibly go up, except that it would start actually burning through some areas and have a reduction in transmission because you didn't have any more susceptible people. But that was to sort of give a scale of it. It wasn't to say, and when we gave the um, press conference in September, Chris Dye and I, we, we were very clear to point out that this is not our prediction of the, you know, what will likely happen in the future. And we wanted to be wrong in, this, in that we didn't want to see this, but this is a projection of what could happen if things continued as they were. And so then in December, we were able to update that and show with the weekly cases, where they had turned round. So we see that, you know, that Guinea had gotten relatively flat. So case numbers had dropped considerably um, in Liberia. And, you know, it was looking encouraging in that it was going down. But the confidence interval, which you see here in the um, shaded color, shows that in all three countries at this point, we couldn't be confident that case numbers were going down. Yes, they weren't going up at the, anything like the rate they had before, but they're doing that. And so this shows the corresponding estimate of RT. This is the effective reproduction number, the average number of secondary cases for an initial case. And it was still wobbling. You know, we need that below one to get control of the epidemic. And it was still wobbling around very, very close to one, particularly in Sierra Leone. So the job wasn't over at that point, but a huge amount of progress had been made. We also could look at subgroups. I mean, because this epidemic was so much bigger than any Ebola epidemic that had happened before, we were able to do subgroup analyses that really hadn't been possible with any level of precision before. And so we could look at the 
the distribution. And one of the things we found with children was that although um, they were less likely to be uh, reported as an Ebola case, if they were, the case fatality rate was much higher in the very young children. So you see, so we've got um, child age groups and then a couple of adult age groups just for comparison. So basically what you want to be, if you want to survive Ebola, is full size, like just adult size, but not have, not have aged. So the very young children were, had a much higher um, death rate comparable to the very oldest adults, and that went down. So part of the concern was that there were, you know, in some cases, not enough detail in um, child's sort of pediatric appropriate um, treatments for people. So it was, there weren't always facilities available to know um, for the people who are doing treatments how you scaled down a particular drug treatment for children. So there were concerns that there might be toxicity in children if they were getting adult level treatments or, you know, sort of inappropriate for their size. So another thing that we looked at was uh, rapid diagnostic tests have been developed and hugely quickly it's been a WHO push to get rapid diagnostic tests available. Now what happened during um, the epidemic was PCR was used. So imagine that you've got these people um, waiting in a holding center and you want to test them and you test them and you've got um, four people, you take some blood and you do a PCR. It comes back, um, it com was coming back on average two days later by the time people got the results, um, partly because the logistics and getting the samples to um, the place for testing and partly get you know, the logistics of just getting the results back. So then you might identify these two people tested negative, um, these four people tested positive, assuming that you know, the sensitivity is very high with PCR. So those people will go on and be treated in an Ebola, Ebola treatment center or similar facility. But this poor person got infected while they were in the holding center. So you can see that possibility. So one possibility as well is to use um, rapid diagnostic test. Now this is quite controversial because its sensitivity is not as high, but one thing that we looked at was if you could do a rapid diagnostic test and just quickly go in and say, okay, use a rapid diagnostic test, who, you know, this could be within an hour or two, who do we, th who tests positive, who tests negative, and then separate them out. Now the possibility, because it's not 100% sensitive, and I don't have a huge diagram, so I can't show you the, the numbers, but you have the possibility of missing positives because you don't have high enough sensitivity. On the other hand, you're less, you can reduce the amount of within holding center transmission by processing people quickly. Um, an alternative would be to use a rapid diagnostic test to send people into high and low risk units. So a sort of pseudo um, release where they go to a low risk unit and then they could get um, reclassified on the basis of PCR. And so what we did was look at fitting to the, you know, the use of PCR. So, so the red is the transmission model and how well it, it fitted um, with the use of PCR. And then comparing what would have happened. So if a rapid diagnostic test had been used instead of PCR, even with um, sensitivity of only 92% and specificity of 85%, what that does is it did actually, it would reduce the cases when case numbers were high because you're getting a lot of true Ebola cases coming through and it's reducing transmission in the holding center. On the other hand, it increases this tail. So you might want to think about, you know, you wouldn't have to do an either or. You could use a rapid diagnostic test when you, you know, when the bed, bed demand was really high and you want to make, you know, reduce the chance that people without Ebola are taking up beds that you need for Ebola patients. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the green one, which is this dual test, it's assuming you've got the facility to divide people up into the high and low risk, then you can, you know, we estimate an epi a reduction of 44% uh, to the epidemic had a dual strategy been available from the beginning. And the rapid tests weren't available from the beginning, so this is a sort of intellectual test to go back and look at it, but it's important for looking toward the future and what might be used. Now, of course, it would be great if fast PCR were available, and that it is shown here in purple to give very similar results. And also, if you had a rapid diagnostic test that was near perfect. So progress is being made, and the um, assumptions that we made on the basis of 
this particular rapid diagnostic test of 92% sensitivity and 85% specificity, there are now tests coming through that appear to, rapid tests that appear to have better diagnostic performance than that. So it could be even better than this. We also stratified on the basis of males and females and found that men on average spend um, half a day longer. So this, this orange period from onset to hospitalization in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, Guinea, and on average, consistently half a day longer. So if there's trans key transmission during that period, maybe getting more transmission from men, although we weren't able to quantify that. But it's important in getting this message that, that we didn't convey in this paper that, well, so you should just get the men in faster because WHO's th key thing was in concern about this result was that people didn't take that away. Men and women and boys and girls all need to get in faster because four and a half days, which it is for females and five on average for males, is too long in both cases. But there still might be extra attention paid to the fact that men were coming in later. We found, the other key difference we found between males and females, this shows by age group um, showing how it, we were concentrating on kids before and shown how the case fatality rate went down with age. Well, once it, it's at the lowest point in, with teenagers, then it gradually goes up. But it's consistently lower for women than for men and that across the age groups, and Guinea showed it less, but you see it very clearly in Liberia and Sierra Leone, which is interesting. And it's not to do with, we adjusted for, in looking at this, um, that time from onset to hospitalization. So that doesn't explain the difference. Even after you adjust for that and for age group, you still find this consistent difference. And finally, I wanted to show you work that we did. Um, this is, two bits of unpublished work looking at pop population level determinants. So we looked at the estimates of the reproduction number by month, by district, and two measures of control. One, which is the proportion of cases reporting funeral exposure. If there was a, a safe and dignified burial, then there wouldn't be the possibility of funeral exposure. You shouldn't have any transmission arising from funerals. Um, and so we found that the, um, R was great. So this shows the um, regression line fitted through here significantly. So where there is more funeral exposure, R is higher, which is what we would expect. So you would be getting a major contribution. But you can look at this and say, okay, then there's an estimate of what R would be if there had been if there was no funeral exposure. If you were completely avoiding that, you would be well below one. And we also showed that there was an important um, correlation with the proportion of people who were being hospitalized within four days of onset. And so again, you can say, well, if everybody was getting in quickly, what would R be? And these correlations were actually independent. So you could adjust for both of these things, and they appeared to be driving. Now, it's still, you still can't prove causation, because these are both control measures that should be getting better as you're getting better at controlling the disease. So it's possible that other things were going as well, but the fact that they were independent correlations strengthens the case that they may have actually been working. And finally, I wanted to, to show you work that we've done looking at the case fatality rate, that's a CFR. So not everybody had an outcome in the line list recorded for their outcome, but for those that did, we were able to estimate the case fatality rate, um, which was about 63% for women, 67% for men. Um, but here that's lumped together on average. But we were able to look at, these are the, the bounds of bi the binomial distribution. So the, the dark ones are the 95% bounds, the dotted ones are the 99% bounds. And you see a number of districts had case fatality rates that were either higher or lower than you would have expected on that basis. We also then went through and adjusted for country case classification, whether or not they were confirmed or probable, and their age, and then we still found the ones that are shown here in the diamonds or the squares, these three out at the top, but also a couple in the middle were had significantly higher case fatality rates than we would have expected. There were also ones that had lower, and we did a similar analysis based on type of treatment center to try and look at, so the ETUs were expected to be the best in terms of having being specifically designed for Ebola, 
but there were also hospitals, general health centers that were lower in facilities than hospitals, and holding centers, which are these places that people would be ideally before they were moved to um, a hospital or ETU if they did have Ebola. And we found four outliers, two that had significantly higher case fatality rates and two that had significantly lower ones than you would have expected. And that is really important because especially when you have a small number of cases, you don't want people just saying, oh, well, these two had the, the worst case fatality rates. Let's go in and completely change that because you would expect that to vary over time. And again, you know, this place had the lowest case fatality rate, but it didn't have very many cases. Um, so we have to do this adjustment before we know if we should take notice of either good or potentially bad practice. And find, those are the um, places where you can read more. Both the, the work on the regressions uh, is, has been submitted for exposure in this exposure patterns driving Ebola transmission and the case fatality rate uh, work specifically looking at um, the extra binomial variation is in the process of being written up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, as planned, uh, we'll have uh, the second talk, which uh, is already being arranged because it's going to be a video conference. We're a bit uh, delayed, but that's okay. Uh,